from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is David Plylar, and I'm a music specialist at the Library of Congress, and uh, among my many interests is uh, the composer and the music of Franz Liszt. I've spent a lot of time uh, with his music, and in particular, these three, per three pieces called the, the Funeral Odes um, that date from about the time 1860 to 1866. Um, I first encountered these pieces about 14 years ago, and I became immediately obsessed with them in a maybe a strange sort of way, but because I saw in them a, an attempt by a composer of great fame who knew that he was destined uh, for obscurity when it came to some of his compositional work. Um, and I could sense in this music a great deal of anguish and uh, disturbance about this possible outcome, this likely outcome. Um, many people know Liszt as the virtuoso pianist, but um, many people don't know that he uh, stopped that career fairly early on in his life um, and switched over to focus on composition. Um, he literally did this with a move to Weimar where he focused on symphonic writing, symphonic poems, conducting other types of activities and produced uh, a huge number of amazing works in the 1850s. Uh, by the time we get to the 1860s, it doesn't seem like all of these things are quite working out the way that he had hoped that they would in terms of uh, recognition from his peers as to um, the value of his compositions. Um, there's really too much to say about these three pieces. Um, I've written several hundred pages about them, uh, and so what I've decided to do is instead of trying to go over every detail, I'm just going to mention a few things, a few salient points about each of the works, and then I'll, I'm going to play them. Um, and I'll also play um, one other related work just to give a little bit of context. Um, there's, these works exist in about 15 different versions. Uh, this is a lot of energy expended by somebody who didn't expect to actually have them performed. Um, the reason that he went into so much detail with these works has to do with their, the motivation for their production. And pretty much, especially the first two, they tend to be uh, based on the deaths of family members. Um, the first piece, uh, which is called Les Morts, and it started off as a, as a funeral ode for organ, um, was written one year after his son Daniel died in 1859. So it started life in 1860. Um, there's a very uh, reverential sort of approach to this piece uh, that has to do with the poetry of Lamennais, who uh, Liszt had a personal relationship with and uh, whose poetry was largely biblically derived. Um, one of the interesting things about this version that we're going to hear, which is the piano version, um, since I don't have an orchestra or an organ handy, um, is that he actually sets some of the text in a wordless expression above the notes. Um, and there's one particular point I'll be making here shortly about uh, what those are. Um, but to give you a sense, before I get into that, to give you a sense of Liszt's mindset at this time, I want to read a quote to you from a letter uh, that he wrote um, a bit later in life to uh, the Baroness von Meyendorf. He writes, I also know Tasso's graceful line, Bramo asai, poco spero, e nulla chiedo. Uh, translates roughly to, I wish for much, hope for little, and ask for nothing. Young ladies in bouts of melancholy apply it to themselves, but for my part, I retain only the last two words without concerning myself any more with the bramare and sperare in this world. At the, this is re referencing Tasso, which I'll get to shortly, um, but there's a point, uh, I just, just between his close confidants, he's already expressing his sense that there's not much hope for his work. In his famous master classes uh, towards the end of his life, 
He would dis openly discourage students from playing his music, especially the more challenging works, challenging from a harmonic and conceptual sense, uh, because he was concerned about how it would affect their careers. Um, he, wanted, he was one of the most generous spirits um, in music history, and he really didn't want his own uh, music to negatively impact uh, the careers of his uh, colleagues, friends, and students. Um, but getting back to uh, Le Moore, there was a version that was done in 1860. I'm just looking at my page here. And this is the one that had, uh, there was also an orchestral version done at this time. And above the violin line, he actually inscribed the words from this poem. And I'll just read them in the translation. Um, one of the most important lines is, happy are the dead that die in the Lord. So something to do with belief and those types of things. And it's, there's much more. And there's actually a certain, if you follow the prosody, you can see that there's actually a one-to-one -one relationship in many places. It's not perfect, but it's quite, quite stunning that it's there. In 1866, uh, his mother dies. At that point, he adds a chorus, a male chorus, and that edition uh, has Latin texts drawn, uh, biblical texts. Um, the one that I'm just going to mention here is the one that, uh, in the original uh, secular version, was happy the dead that die in the Lord, and then the choral edition was blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. So he's almost uh, coming back at this music later and sanctifying it in some particular way. Um, I'd like to show you what that chord sequence is because it's a very important one for this particular piece. So I'm just going to play you that sequence that comes back again and again but doesn't resolve. So this is just that uh, happy are the dead that die in the Lord sequence. So you note that it doesn't actually feel like it's final. It hasn't really resolved. Um, in a way, he actually never really resolves it, but he has an interesting uh, manner of doing so in what I call kind of an oscillation sort of process that he um, does at the end of lots of his religious works. And uh, to keep that on a sim simple level, um, basically it's like taking a chord and moving to a related chord, moving back, maybe moving above it, and moving back, always having a fixed chord in mind that it oscillates around. Um, in a sense, you might be able to say that this is uh, some sort of doubt that creeps in, or some sort of, uh, uh, but it, it definitely feels like some sort of arrival, and it usually has some sort of uh, transcendental component to it. Um, to illustrate, part of where he's coming from and why this particular type of an idea is of great interest to him. Um, I'd like to play uh, one piece that is one example among many, many, many solo piano religious works. Um, this is an Ave Maria uh, that was written, actually, strangely enough, it was contributed to a, um, a study uh, pedagogy book. Um, but it possesses uh, certain characteristics that I find very uh, exemplary of one particular type of religious music of, of Liszt. Um, this is that it tends to be, first of all, E major. Um, it tends to move into some sort of ecstatic religious fervor. This is not typical of all of Liszt's religious music, especially as he got later and later in life, it became more and more subdued and held back. So don't think that this is all of what his uh, religious music is like, but I want you to hear this just so you can get a sense of how this applies to the funeral odes when I play that. So this is uh, an Ave Maria. <laughs> 
thank you. Um, <clears throat> so some of the other things that I want you to think about with that particular piece and the types of things that he's bringing out, um, hopefully you could hear that oscillation at the end uh, when it gets gigantic and then uh, falls back uh, quite quietly um, because that plays a pivotal role in the first of the funeral loads. Um, another thing is that he labels uh, certain types of uh, pitches in a particular way, like using the word campana, meaning wants some sort of a bell-like sound in the bass. So one of my goals, um, not sure whether I achieve it or not with, when looking at these, is to really pay attention to his uh, particular markings as well as his pedal markings. Um, pianos are different today than they were in Liszt's time, but Liszt tended to have very forward-looking uh, pedal markings and other and all the, all the writing, of course, is quite forward-looking, um, as much of modern piano music that we know today uh, would not have evolved in the same way had it not been for Liszt's contribution in that way. Um, moving on to the second work, um, it's called La Note. Uh, this was done in about, uh, composed one of the versions in about 1863, um, following the death of his daughter, Blandina, who um, uh, died in 1862. Uh, this piece is incredibly complicated to explain in terms of the, the types of references that he makes. Um, in some ways, it's one of the most uh, meta-compositional compositions of the 19th century, if I can throw that out there. Um, the key thing that it's related to in a piece that might be familiar to you is Il Penzeroso, which comes from the second volume of the Years of Pilgrimage, um, composed in the late 1830s, uh, but not actually published until 1858. Um, this music is extremely dark. Uh, it has a certain antecedent in the, um, or precedent rather, in the uh, case of uh, the Beethoven funeral march movement from uh, the Sonata, um, I guess Opus 26, but it's A flat minor. Um, it's a very dark piece, that's all I can say, and it's this, it serves as the bookends for this uh, ode. Uh, so he, it's not repeated verbatim at all, um, but he takes that and turns it into a ternary structure for La Note. Um, in La Note, he references a quatrain by Michelangelo, um, whose statuary is also referenced. Um, originally, Il Penzeroso uh, was the, the thinker statue. Um, he's imagining now, looking back from the night time of his life, later life, at what he's accomplished before and commenting on it. Um, the quote, let me just pull up the quote the, to give you a sense of what the, the, the Michelangelo quote is. Basically, um, sleep is dear to me, and even more to be made of stone, while harm and shame endure, not to see, not to hear, is a great fortune for me. Therefore, do not wake me, speak softly. So it's basically advocating for the permanency of the work, and at least there's that to hold on to when everything else falls apart in your actual life. So it's kind of a dark uh, sort of a, a point, uh, but that's not the only thing that's going on there. Um, what I will mention is that uh, it has another example of unuttered text uh, that is used, and this, is, this happens in the central section. Um, basically, uh, it took some time to figure out exactly where this was, um, but it's uh, Dolces Moriens Reminiscitur Argos. And that's where the title of this t talk comes from. Basically, as this one particular character from the Aeneid is dying, he fondly remembers his homeland. This is just written in above this particular spot. Um, let me pull that up, page 61. Um, just to give you a little bit of context here, just before this part in the Aeneid, um, basically we hear, uh, after the speech of this enemy, uh, he made a long cast and the whistling spear winged on, clanged on the shield, but sprang away to fix itself between the flank and the groin of Antares, a distinguished soldier there, Hercules' old companion. Sent from Argos, he stayed close to Evander and made his home in an Italian town. 
Killed by a stroke that missed another, now he lay and skyward turned his eyes in death, rem remembering the sweet land Argos. Um, Theodore Adel uh, wrote a great article about this particular uh, movement, um, and he, I'll just cite him here. He says, for Liszt, the choice was more than apt. He too lived in an Italian town, far from his native Hungary. By now he was a wanderer, never again to have a permanent home. And, and had he not borne many spears for Wagner and other friends, uh, that Liszt linked his own fate to Ontario's, and that he wished that this be clearly understood is proven with the very next measures. Uh, this Hungarian cadence, or Boccaccio, is familiar from his rhapsodies. And with this musical signature, Liszt himself enters the music. Uh, this is absolutely what's happening. There's no doubt about it. You have this very strange, uh, dark music, and I'm just going to play you the part from the moment when he writes this uh, quote from the Aeneid. I'll just play that little passage. very clearly related to Liszt and um, meant that as a self-reference. Um, what he does with that is quite interesting. Uh, I won't go into it, whether it turns out well or not, uh, you'll you be the judge. Um, but one interesting thing that I did have the chance since coming to work at the library is to actually see the library's version of the piano and violin version, which is um, one of the few chamber works that Liszt actually wrote. Uh, he didn't, and most of them tend to be transcriptions of other works of his. Um, interestingly, uh, the final passage of this middle section um, goes into an extended uh, E-flat major passage, but it ends prematurely in E um, and with a slightly uh, shorter version in the violin and piano version. And there's a not quite intelligible quotation that's been crossed out beneath it uh, from Moliere um, that I'm still hoping to eventually get, uh, I had a bunch of people helped me try to figure it out uh, uh, before today, but uh, we couldn't quite get it, but it does um, bring into some questions about the order of composition, which is another big issue, which I won't get into here, um, but an interesting one. Um, moving on to the final work, uh, the final funeral ode. The library owns the, uh, orchestral version of this work. Um, and this is actually an epilogue to the symphonic poem Tasso, uh, Lamento e Triunfo, which was uh, an earlier symphonic poem from the 1850s. Actually, um, first version is from 1848, 49. Um, and this, again, has this, uh, this tremendously complicated history to it, which I will summarize thusly. Um, it started off as the idea was going to be an overture to Goethe's play on Torcato Tasso. Um, then at some point, the, ins the source of inspiration switched to Byron's Lament of Tasso. Um, I traced this in a, in a paper just about why he would make that particular switch, and it has to do with talking about the artist in general and coming to the very specific artist, and that tends to be the big difference between Goethe and Byron in that respect. Um, but why Tasso in the first place? Uh, that's you know, maybe a fair question as well. In my view, Liszt had something of a Tasso fixation. And the idea is that you toil and you work as hard as you can, and the only time that you're going to get recognition is when you pass away. Um, that maybe you'd have some sort of triumphant funeral procession, and that would somehow make up something, but it's really a bittersweet sort of uh, end result for, uh, for artists who do not receive the, laur the laurels that they might be due, due while they're alive. 
Um, so that's one of the themes in both the Goethe and the Byron that gets taken up. And Liszt clearly applies this to himself, but he often made, would make these a side statement saying, I won't have a triumphant funeral procession at any time. And sure enough, it didn't happen. He, um, he passed away in Bayreuth uh, at the festival, and uh, his wishes were not um, uh, honored, unfortunately. He had actually indicated in 1865 or so that he wanted to have uh, La Note uh, played at his funeral, um, but it was not. Um, and this was, it's a complicated, uh, Alan Walker wrote a book about this. Um, it's a complicated thing, but it had to do with not diminish, taking away the glory and the laurels from Wagner and Bayreuth at that time, which is really a sad story. Um, but mo moving back to why he came back to Tasso, in 1865-66. Um, he decided to, uh, he, the original work had been based on a gondolier song, and I'll play, uh, hopefully remember correctly what that, uh, th that tune is. Um, so that idea becomes basically the uh, blueprint for the entire work of the original symphonic poem Tasso. Uh, the piece is a set, basically a set of variations on that, and it goes through a wide range of material. Um, when it gets to the epilogue, the triumphal funeral of Tasso, um, it is indeed another symphonic poem. It should be listed as another, the 14th symphonic poem. Um, because it is a massive work, and in fact, all three orchestral versions are excellent pieces that should be performed. Of course, I would advocate for that, but um, it brings up another issue um, that I'll get to shortly. I should finish the thought with the Tasso theme, in that that idea is then used uh, in many ways in this epilogue again, and so you'll hear it in different guises, but it's not the sole uh, focus there's quite a bit of transformation going on as well. Um, I think the last things that I'll say about this before diving into the pieces, um, so I'll maybe ask Nick to head on up. Nick is gonna be kind enough to turn my pages for me. Um, because these pieces have so many different versions, uh, List was, as many of you know, one of the preeminent transcribers um, in history. Um, there's really nobody who compares to him. There are lots of excellent transcribers out there, but they kind of followed his model. What he does for each version that he presents is creates uh, something that feels like it was composed for that instrument, um, especially the piano versions. I'm not totally sure whether the orchestral version came first or the piano version came first of the Tasso piece, but um, and there are arguments kind of going both ways. Um, but when you play them, and this is, they, these pieces are not played terribly often, which is why I'm doing it, um, you have to kind of pretend like you're playing uh, at an orchestra to kind of let that um, sound build up. And so I'm just gonna kind of go for it and hope for the best. Um, uh, so, I think the last thing that I'll mention is that I'm going to play these, I'm also arguing for their understanding as a set because there are certain connections that hold between them. So I'm going to play through all three back to back, um, just going straight through. <laughs> so, um, so be aware of that and hopefully you'll hear some of these collections and you'll also um, hopefully hear something that would make them not be destined for obscurity forever. Hopefully they'll be uh, interesting enough to um, uh, pique your interest. Um, and then if there's time afterwards, uh, which there may or may not be, um, I'd be happy to take some questions. And we also have uh, the two manuscripts that the library owns up on stage. So at that point, I'd be very happy to have you, anybody who's interested and has time to come up and take a look at those. So, all right. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thank you all very much for coming. I know those are uh, some kind of heavy pieces, but I really appreciate you listening. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but if there are any questions, I'm up here and happy to answer them. So <laughs> thanks again for coming. And you're welcome to see the items too. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.